Well, good morning. I'm glad you're here for the presentation. God's not dead, but atheism is a dead end. My name's Mel McGinnis. I pastor the Kind Tone Congregational Church. And with me to help make the presentation is Pastor Jeff Short, Dr. Jerry Shaneborn, and we'll have an opening remark, an unusual opening remark that was submitted to me this past week that will be read quite shortly. Uh, I want to make uh, known that hopefully next Saturday, this same time, I don't think it's too early for people to get up and be here by 10.30, a response to the Noah movie that has been on screen, I think, last night was its debut. And hopefully I'll have at the event next Saturday a video produced by Ray Comfort in regard to this movie and also a follow-up that I think I'll do showing where Hollywood got it wrong. And we need the biblical record to set it straight. So that will probably be next Saturday, 10.30. Hope to have it on a Facebook, the announcement, in the paper, and any other means that we can utilize publicly to get the word out. I'm going to have uh, myself bring a presentation to you, as well as I said, Pastor Jeff Short and Jerry Shaneborn, but I'd first like to have my friend, Tim Hagberg, uh, he may make an opening remark, but he will read to you a submission I received through the email from Norm Carlson. I thought I would have that read, and you can uh, evaluate what he says concerning what we will present uh, this morning to you. So. Without any further ado, I'm going to have Tim come on forward. If you'd like to make an opening remark, that's fine. Or if you just would like to jump right into what Norm has said, we'll do that as well. You're recording this? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would just like to say that uh, it is uh, a good pleasure to represent Mr. Carlson here. Uh, I, I know him well, and uh, intellectually, I think he's, pr he's probably... Uh, I have some issues with this, but I'm going to try to leave my bias out of it and read it as directly as possible. And uh, honestly, as I proofread it, there, there's some words here that I don't even understand. But I think that I think that I'll get them right by their context. Uh, so I'm going to try to uh, just bring this as direct as possible. And this is from Mr. Norman Carlson, and it reads, "Mel, I will not be attending your event at the Prendergast Library. Uh, I have a previous uh, engagement. We'll let that go. Uh, if I could be there." I would expect a considerable amount of intellectual sloppy and invalid arguments and statements. It is totally erroneous, wrong, and unjustified to equate atheism with political ideology, moral or immoral behavior, or anything else. Such failures to distinguish between correlation and causation and assuming guilt by association are, acad are endemic among Christians. Atheism is simply the recognition that there is no compelling evidence or logic that requires the conclusion or belief in the existence of a God. Even the Bible admits that such a belief must rest entirely on unsupported faith. And I wish Christians would consistently grant the same admission instead of insisting on having it both ways. People seem to be tricked by the fact that God is a familiar three-letter word into accepting the assumption that it is easy and logically legitimate to assume he exists with all his eternal, omnipotent, and omniscient properties. If he indeed has all the necessary properties ascribed to him, assuming he exists is actually the most huge, extreme, and logically unjustifiable assumption the human mind can make. It subsumes that all other great big question assumptions and adds one far greater on top of them. Think about it. I resent the nearly universal practice of equating liberalism and atheism. Many liberals are not atheists. I will not address their problems. However, 
I am nearly as true and consistent as conservative as you can find, and I believe in no God, no miracles, no supernatural realm or events of any kind. Furthermore, the intolerance of Christianity shown by liberal atheists is a function of the liberalism and not the atheism. B. Can you get that straight? <laughs> I beat that out for you. <laughs> um, and then uh, here's where I here, here's where uh, one of the reasons that I do admire and, re and have a, a level a certain uh, a very certain level of respect for Mr. Carlson. He says this personally, and this is where he's speaking personally. I am sick to death of the self-described Christian believers who treat your spouses, work, or professional associates and strangers more unjustly and rudely and unkindly than I do. I am sick to death with self-described Christian believers who are more vulgar and crude than I am. I am sick to death of uh, self-described Christian adulterers and lecturers. All of these people look down on me accusingly and self-righteously. And until that changes, I don't ever again want to hear these stupid arguments about how without a God there is no reason or incentive for morality, civility, or justice, and how atheism ultimately leads to uh, Nazism and communism. Mel, I would like you to read this to your assembly Saturday, Norman. I hope I get that. Filled in well for Norm to appreciate what you had to say there and uh, have uh, Norm uh, participate in that way. I, too, am a friend of Norm and appreciate what uh, he uh, communicates here to our community, especially when it comes to conservatism. But I want to make the case, God's not dead, but atheism is a dead end. In his book... A Shattered Visage, The Real Face of Atheism, Dr. Rabbi Zacharias makes this statement. Nothing is as important as the truth and no knowledge so dangerous as a lie. The stakes can hardly be any higher than atheism and theism. Both cannot be true at the same time. It's one or the other. One must be true and the other is a lie. God is not dead. But atheism is a dead end. It's March Madness. You know that's the season of March Madness when you hear about it, the NCAA tournament. I saw it more than 30 years ago at a Section 5 semifinal Class C contested basketball game. Bob Treader was on the foul line. With mere seconds left on the game, he had two foul shots. Their team, Oakfield, Alabama, was down by two points. Two foul shots to win it all. The first shot went up, rolled around the rim, and fell off. The second shot went up and he missed it! And Bloomfield celebrated and Oakfield, Alabama was devastated. And I watched Bob Treader as he crossed the follow line and shook his fist at the rim. Shaking your fist when you're angry. It's been told by Joseph Stalin's sister that as he was on his deathbed, he looked up for the last time and shook his fist at God and died. I want to demonstrate just by the emotion of anger that that in itself is evidence for the existence of God. Think about these words. 
My days have passed. My plans are shattered. Yet the desires of my heart turn night into day. In the face of the darkness, light is near. If the only home I hope for is the grave. If I spread out my bed in the realm of darkness. If I say to corruption, you are my father. And to the worm, my mother or my sister. Where then is my hope. Who can see any hope for me? Will it go down to the gates of death? Will we descend together in the dust? Job said those words from the book of Job. Basically, he was saying this. If all I have is the grave, the darkness of death, and the corruption of my body into dust for my future, then what hope is there? My days on earth only lead to a dead end. The deep questions, tortured thoughts, and agonizing ruminations almost sound like a hapless atheist. He, Job, was not just having a physical crisis afflicted with painful body sores and a family crisis with his household wiped out. He was also having a faith crisis crisis, being tested to the limits. Job, asking all the hard questions, anguishing in his grief, and stuck in a gauntlet of despairing emotions and woe-is-me experiences, still had God. Very real, but far off to him. If God wasn't in the picture in the process of letting off all his emotional steam pent up in him, Job would have just been shaking his fist at the rim. Have you seen anybody flip out over mixing baking soda with vinegar? You know, as the professor teaches his class in college that man is nothing more than the byproduct of chemical reactions, what's that rage inside of him when he's told that his daughter's been violated by a molester? If man is just a byproduct of chemical reaction, as the professor says, then why... Should he be enraged at the molester? It's no different than baking soda mixing with vinegar. We've all heard of him, Charles Darwin. And I don't think you can ignore the death of his daughter having a profound impact on his life. He did not pass it off as if it was nothing. It understandably naturally and obviously afflicted and affected him. It grieved and angered him. What was the ultimate target of his anger? Chemicals? Baking soda and vinegar mixing? Or was it God? He popularized a belief or a philosophy about science which made atheism intellectually satisfying. Darwin was in a crisis over his daughter. In his crisis and work that followed, did it lead him towards or lead him away from God? In the movie, God is Not Dead, Josh Wheaton, who made the case for God in his philosophy class, struck a nerve in the atheist professor. The nerve that was struck in the professor was the death of his mother during the teenage years of his life. As that scene reached its climax between the professor and the student, the professor unloaded the full force of his anger on the student, and the student fired back and said, why do you hate something so much that you think doesn't exist? 
anger, not at chemicals, not at baking soda mixing with vinegar, anger at God. Two young women in real life both had a miscarriage. One grieved, sorrowed, and mourned, but in time she recovered and reached resolution. She's a Christian. The other flew into a rage on Facebook, unleashing her fury with language too vile for some to take. She's an atheist. Now, I'm not saying all atheists do that. But for her, that early, nascent, fragile, human life, which she longed to see emerge from her womb, died. The uncontainable and uncontrollable anger was not just over a ball of cells, but a baby lost. What was the target of her anger? Chemicals? Vinegar mixed with baking soda? Or was that anger really directed toward God? Doesn't anger tell us something? Anger is not necessarily a bad or evil thing. It often is a sinful thing in human beings who have been betrayed or have been depraved by sin. But anger tells us that something is wrong and that there is more to us than us being a byproduct of chemical reactions. I heard a pastor this past week speak of an encounter he had with a young woman who had just miscarried. She was devastated. She was in crisis. What woman wouldn't be? As the pastor stood by her, he gently told her of the Bible story in Genesis where Hagar was fleeing to the wilderness and the angel of the Lord coming to her. And from that story, the pastor told the woman who miscarried that the Lord knew of her sorrow and sadness. And like Hagar, hearing the word from the angel of the Lord and following the leading of the Lord, the pastor invited her to draw near to God with her load of grief. You see, in the tenderness of that moment, she drew near to God with the pastor in prayer. She took a step forward, seeing it through to God. In the movie, God's Not Dead, a young female reporter was diagnosed with cancer. They'll never forget what she said when she heard the diagnosis. I don't have time for cancer. Wow. Later, she found out it was terminal. And if you've seen it, she's there typing on her blog, and she says to her readers, I'm going to die. And then she flipped, ripped that computer and tossed it to the ground and broke out in great tears. Was she mad at chemicals? Was she mad at vinegar mixing with baking soda? Or did that anger have to do with God? In our times of crisis, what will we do? As with Job, they invite us to draw near to God and we are to follow his lead. Otherwise, crises can begin to close us down and whatever openness there is 
become shut if we don't follow the lead of the Lord. Speaking of one who closed down and came to a dead end, Bertrand Russell, the atheist, said, All the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspirations, all the brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. The dead end. Leading atheist of the 1960s, John Paul Sartre, said at the end of his life, I have found my philosophy unlivable. He came to a dead end. Oscar Wilde, another atheist, wrote, As terrible as what the world did to me, nothing was as terrible as what I did to myself. And then, on his deathbed, the atheist called for a priest to be by his side. There was a young man who went to seminary to become a priest, and he underwent a crisis, a major crisis of faith, which resulted in him bailing out on being a priest as well as bailing out on God. He was unknown to the world then, but became an ardent, militant, and tyrannical atheist murdering millions in the country he ruled. And that former seminary student was Joseph Stalin. He's the one that shook his fist in anger on his deathbed. That anger exhibited in his fist was not really a fist shaking at the rim, but a fist clenched at the reality of God. You know, Tom Treader, the guy I mentioned who was at the free throw line at the end of the game, when he went to that rim, was it really the rim's fault? You know, we are mad at what's wrong in the world. It could be worse. We could be numb at what's happening to the world. Being numb is worse than being mad. Numb people won't do much. Though anger can be dangerous, you at least have an awareness present and energy there to work with. The question is not if we have anger, but what we are going to do with our anger. We trivialize it by saying that it is the billion-year byproduct of chemical reactions. We see it for what it is when we acknowledge that it, too, is a gift of God, which has become distorted by sin. Anger is a gift indicating that something is wrong in this world in which we live. A century ago, the Times London asked their readers... A question. And the great social critic and exquisite writer of that time, G.K. Chesterton, replied to the question by the paper which stated, What's wrong with the world? And Chesterton wrote, I am, yours truly, G.K. Chesterton. Who here could say with Chesterton, I am what's wrong with the world? There is someone else who answers, I am, though not in answer to the question of what's wrong with this world, but what's right for this world. He says in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. And though he did not know it at the time, Job 
What did he say? I know my Redeemer lives. God's not dead, but atheism is a dead end.